Lastly, our, our final guest, um, Vanessa Bailey, who takes some um, sort of a little introduction, really, but I am going to read quite a long introduction. Um, it's an endorsement from John Pilger. Uh, first of all, just to say that uh, Vanessa Bailey is a courageous and investigative journalist, having travelled to Syria six times since the beginning of the conflict there. Her work has been criticised by the mainstream media, but lauded by many Syrians on the ground in Syria, who suffered under this proxy regime change war for seven years. Um, even Alex Thompson of Channel 4 News, in his latest piece, was compelled to report the words of Syrian civilians now liberated from terrorists in East Ghouta. Uh, those are the words um, that Vanessa has tried to give a voice to all of these years, but has been criticised and, and, and shut down. Um, I think legendary journalist uh, John Pilger says it the best, and this is his statement. He says... Um, there is only one piece of advice to give you. You must stand up to the bullies and censors. Vanessa Bealey is in trouble with them because she wrote truths that counted their misrepresentation of the invasion of Syria by US and UK-backed jihadis. Vanessa is a fine reporter who was one of the finalists in the 2017 Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism, perhaps the most distinguished prize um, Distinguished Award for Truly Independent Journalism in Britain, which The Guardian itself was proud to receive in the past. What the bullies and censors can't stand is that she has exposed the fraudulence of the UK and US-funded white helmets, and so they resort to craven smears. She's not an apologist for Assad. She makes clear that the that her statement, the proudest day of my life, referred to the American peace delegation to Syria, of which she is a member. In any case, Vanessa has written all, uh, has written all this, and it is the responsibility of you and me to familiarize ourselves with the background to these attacks and smears. You should be proud to host Vanessa, which we are, who has my unqualifi unqualified endorsement. This is a matter of freedom of speech, John Pilger. So with no foot more uh, ado, Vanessa Bealey. Um, I'm a bit overwhelmed by that. John Pilger um, has been a hero of mine um, since I could read, basically. Um, so, yeah, um, incredibly humbled by that and humbled by the presence of everyone here um, showing a determination to defend free speech um, and the right of everyone to express themselves and to express an opinion, even if we do disagree with it. That person should have the right to express that opinion without feeling intimidated, without feeling threatened, and without feeling inhibited. Um, so thank you all for coming here today and proving um, that free speech is still um, something that we all should be striving for. Um, the first point that I would like to make is that um, on the 21st of May 2018, we saw the first terrorism-free sunset in Damascus for seven years. Um, I didn't expect to actually suddenly get emotional over that, but it's a very emotional moment. Having myself and Eva Bartlett and my friends over here visited, and, and um, Mike and Ali, we've all been in Damascus when the mortars have fallen. We've spoken to Syrians who've told us that they're walking home with their shopping, and suddenly they're picking children's body parts up off the ground, and I'm not exaggerating here. Um, the last time I was leaving Damascus in January, um, mortars fell just as we actually got out of the old city, just as children were coming out of school. So those children were deliberately targeted by the terrorist groups um, east, in eastern Ghouta that has now been liberated. So I'd just like to read you a little part of this message that was posted on uh, the Syrian Arab Army Facebook page that sort of covers all of the military campaigns um, inside Syria. And I think this is probably the most important part of the message. 
This is not a victory for a side over the other. This is the victory of the people of Syria over terrorism and reminding the world again that Syria will never be a puppet state. Neither by direct nor by indirect aggression will its people allow that to happen. And its military, aided by its allies, will uphold their constitutional duty to make sure, no matter how dark it gets, Syria will prevail. Now, there's been a lot of fuss over this event from the mainstream media um, that I personally have called members of the mainstream media terrorists. I didn't actually make that statement, but of course my, my proposal to focus on the embedding of mainstream journalists with known terrorist groups as part of this event, as part of um, a violation of our own moral um, duty, as, as Tim beautifully expressed, but also in a legal sense, um, according to our own British legislation regarding terrorism. Now, again, I'm not a lawyer, um, but it struck me that this is an important aspect of what is going on, and to what degree does it cease to be journalism and begin to be the lionization and the glorification of terrorist groups. Um, but I want to start sort of a little bit further up the chain, if you like, with actual war propaganda. Is it a crime against humanity and should it be criminalized internationally? Syrians actually declare what the Western media is doing to them as media terrorism. Their words, not mine. So basically, is it free speech? Or is it a crime? Professors, and I'm not an academic, but I'm pretending to be one today. Professors John Witten and Arthur Larson in their book, Propaganda Towards Disarmament in the War of Words, published in 1964, emphasized that propaganda is a threat to peace, as Peter has very eloquently told us. If we mean to work out ways of dismantling the most dangerous weapons of physical destruction, we should also be struggling to work out ways of dismantling psychological weapons used to exacerbate the causes of war. The next two or three slides are actually taken from a paper, War Propaganda, a Serious Crime Against Humanity, written by Yuri uh, Bobrekov. In 1946, you all know about the Nuremberg War Trials, um, in which major war criminals of the Hitler regime established that war propaganda is one of the means of promoting war, thus confirming the criminal nature of war propaganda. And this issue was specifically emphasized in the UN General Assembly's resolution in no on November the 3rd, 1947, the General Assembly condemns all forms of propaganda in whatsoever country conducted which is either designed or likely to provoke or encourage any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression. What I also want to demonstrate today is those who are advocating peace, those who are adhering to international law, those who look for political and diplomatic resolution are the ones that are being smeared and are the ones that are being threatened with closure and who are being silenced. Those who are promoting war, those who are producing propaganda that will take us to war, are the ones who are being awarded and lauded universally among the establishment. Um, March 1950, the Supreme Soviet passed a law on the defense of peace. And as part of that law, they decreed to recognize that war propaganda, under whatever form it is made, undermines the cause of peace, creates the threat of a new war, and is the gravest crime against humanity. In 1953, in the General Assembly, the Soviet Union made a proposal to denounce war propaganda. A Soviet draft definition of aggression presented to the UN General Assembly in 1957 defined war propaganda as ideological 
aggression. By this definition, the state is considered to have committed ideological aggression if it encourages war propaganda, encourages propaganda of using atomic, bacteriological, ironic, chemical and other kinds of mass extermination weapons, or C, stimulates propaganda of fascist Nazi views, racial or national superiority, hatred and disdain for other peoples. I would argue that is exactly what our mainstream media is doing in lionizing the terrorists and their messages and giving a platform for their messages from inside Syria. Even though this resolution was in an alignment with the UN Charter, that all member states have a duty to preserve peace, it was blocked by Western states. Christopher Black, who's an international criminal lawyer, said this, the West relied on arguments of free speech, arguments that do not hold water, since war propaganda is not designed to enlighten people, but to twist their minds into thoughts of hatred and war. It's a dehumanization process. We heard from our speakers how the Syrian Arab army has been routinely dehumanized by Western media. It's described as Assad's army. It's described as a Shia Muslim militia. Nothing could be further from the, tr from the truth. The army is an army of conscripts. It comes from the Syrian people. It is made up, as all of Syria is, of a wide spectrum of all communities within Syria. And actually, the majority of the Syrian Arab army are Sunni Muslim. Now we come on to the, um, the actual use, I believe, of propaganda, war propaganda, by our media. This was a report, um, Peter thankfully has covered much of the doom and truth, <laughs> so I don't have to go too far into that. But this is Simon Tistel of The Guardian, who wrote this article, I think about two days after the alleged Duma chemical attack. Um, the title sort of says it all. After Duma, the West's response to Syria's regime must be military. Now, we hadn't, I mean, the dust hadn't even settled on the story at this point, but we're already being told by The Guardian that we really must go and bomb Syria because um, it's, a, it, you know, the regime has attacked its own civilians. Now, I was also, I was in Syria um, during this time. And what I have to say, this was also psychological warfare. Because the Syrian people lived under the threat of military retribution for almost two weeks. I mean, they live under it all the time, but this was particularly intense. These people had only just been liberated from Ghouta. They had only just escaped six years of brutal, oppressive, Islamo-fascist, occupation. And having just escaped that, they then have the threat of escalated military action by our governments on a spurious, dodgy non-dossier. So the psychological warfare was a very important factor in this, and that was one of the things that I saw everywhere I went. People were actually saying to me, I just wish they'd get on with it. I wish they'd do their worst so that we can deal with it and then we can move on. Now, the actual image that was used to accompany this report was extraordinary to me. A rocket, bear in mind that, that these articles are lionizing and glorifying terrorism. So here we have a rocket is launched from Eastern Ghouta, and then we have the familiar hyperbole and sensationalism. Eastern Ghouta has become Syrian Srebrenica, so a direct link back to another narrative um, that did take us to war. And also, these rockets that were fired from Eastern Ghouta that, according to this report, were, were the actions of an oppressed rebel community, they actually, these were posters, I, you probably can't see them terribly well because most of them were behind glass, so it was actually quite hard for me to photograph them. But these posters were in all the church courtyards in Damascus, detailing 
um, the victims of those mortar attacks from 2012 until February 2018 when the casualty counter stopped because the liberation, the battle for liberation was ongoing. Um, so basically 14,800 mortars, rockets, explosive bullets were fired from um, eastern Ghouta into the main city of Damascus. 11,000 Syrian civilians were killed, not military targets, Syrian civilians. Of those, 1,500 were children. 30,000 are permanently disabled. And when I say permanently disabled, I mean missing limbs. I mean children, 16-year-olds. One girl in January lost, um, I believe, both her legs in these attacks. So these are not, you know, there's serious disablement here. And these people will have to live with this for the rest of their lives. And just to show, I mean, when East Aleppo was being liberated, we had exactly the same hyperbole, exactly the same hysteria from the mainstream media, particularly the Guardian that seems to be at the vanguard of these media campaigns to demonize and criminalize the Syrian government, the Syrian army and its allies during these liberation campaigns. But what I also have to say is there's an eerie silence once the liberation is complete. I was in East Aleppo during the liberation and just after. I didn't see a single mainstream media journalist there. Not one. They weren't there to see how the people were that they'd been protecting and defending for the last six years. They were nowhere to be seen. Exactly the same in Eastern Ghouta. There were rather more of them this time. I think they probably learned that they should really show their face this time. But to a degree, we don't hear anything now about the fact that these people, many of them, over 70,000 now, have returned home to Eastern Ghouta. The others are being cared for in the Hajjale and a number of other um, internally displaced people camps where they're being fed by the Syrian government, where they're being homed by the Syrian government, where they're being educated. Children are back in school in those camps in secular education, never talked about by the mainstream media. None of this aftercare, if you like, by the Syrian government is ever mentioned or talked about because it would deny the narrative that, that their entire underpinning of this war relies upon. Um, this is just an example and, and of the rhetoric employed by Tistel to manufacture consent for war. Um, I'll just read through them very quickly. Bashar al-Assad's continued mass murder of civilians means there can be no more excuses. Both morality and self-interest demand action. I'm not quite sure what the self-interest is. It's time for Britain and its allies to take concerted, sustained military action to curb Bashar al-Assad's ability to murder Syrian citizens at will. All this while those Syrian citizens are being aided to escape Eastern Ghouta via the humanitarian corridors that I witnessed that were set up by the Syrian government and the Russian reconciliation teams. And then he ends up with, or did all those writhing children imagine the gas? Now then I'm going to move on to Kathy Newman. And there's a reason I'm, I'm quickly skipping to her, because you will see the correlation between the language that Simon Tistel uses and the language that is employed um, by Kathy Newman one day before the tripartite bombing um, of Syria. And again, I was in Damascus when that bombing raid happened. So this is an interview with a Russian ambassador to the UK, Alexander Yakovenko. Please note how Yakovenko deals with one of the questions. But when you see children writhing in agony, pale-faced, do you then abandon Assad? Would you withdraw? Would you abandon support for Assad if the OPCW proved that he was responsible for that kind of thing? This is a very British way of putting the question because uh, Assad is the president of Syria and he was elected by, by the Syrians. It's up to the Syrians to decide whether they are going to keep that president or not. He is also, in the words of the elected president of the United States, a gas-killing animal. 
Do you sleep easy at night supporting someone like that? Extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, anyone who watched Kathy Newman's vicious attack on Dr. Boutena Shaban one day after the US coalition had criminally massacred Syrian Arab army soldiers defending civilians in Deir Azor from ISIS will be equally disgusted by her tone in this interview. But what is interesting here, what was the main purpose of Kathy Newman? What did it appear to be? To divorce Assad from Russia. She repeated it three times. That's interesting because in February 2018, Al-Akbar, a Lebanese media outlet, released leaked diplomatic email from, from the British Embassy in Washington detailing a five-point plan to disintegrate Syria. And as part of that email, David Satterfield, US Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East, said, it is about getting the Russians to let Assad go. Through meetings of the Security Council and a broad public communication campaign. Well, well done, Kathy. Um, and of course... Peter brilliantly covered um, Duma and the, and the lack of a dodgy dossier, but also what has not been um, mentioned by many people is that Russia did an excellent job of taking um, witnesses to The Hague as part of the OPCW um, investigation. Um, and among those was Hassan Diab, who was actually the little boy in the videos that were used to justify the tripartite attack on Syria. And he basically testified, as they all did, as did all the doctors and medical staff that myself and Eva Bartlett, Robert Fisk have spoken to, that this was not a chemical weapon attack, that this was an ordinary attack during the liberation campaign. The children came in with smoke inhalation problems um, and they were being treated. And then suddenly the white helmets broke on the scene along with a number of other actors and started dousing them in water. And again, what is interesting, the closing remarks by the permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the OPCW, Ambassador Alexander Shulgin. He talks about the fact that at all costs, they mustn't allow a cold war to develop into a hot war. This is the language of peace, which we don't hear from our officials and our media, ever. Or rarely, I should say, before I'm done for libel over that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, he ends with, the only way to refrain from confrontation and to start a search for a solution based on the mutual respect and consideration of interests of all sides in accordance with international law our future and the future of our children is at stake. When do we hear? When do we hear that in this country? You know, Tim touched on this. It's incredibly important. It's not about us. It's about our children and their children. Advocating peace, not war. Complete contrast to Western media. So then let's come down to international law. And this is a quote that I use um, all the time from a wonderful professor based in Lebanon, Amal Saad um, Gorayab. International law is indifferent to the perceived legitimacy of the state and to the form of government. Both democracies and authoritarian regimes have the right to fight insurgencies and to defend themselves from external powers which aid the insurgents. Either way, it falls under the domestic jurisdiction of the state. Foreign powers are prohibited from assisting insurgents. The General Assembly Resolution 2131 declares that no state shall organize, assist, foment, finance, incite, or tolerate subversive, terrorist, or armed activities directed towards the violent overthrow of the regime of another state or interfere in civil strife in another state. So what do we do? 
Juliet Harkin. We, BBC Media Action, worked in 2004 with individuals within the ministry who wanted to change, in Syria that is, and tried to get them to be the drivers of that. All media development work that has been done in Syria has, in my opinion, been predicated upon this idea that there can be change from within. You have an authoritarian regime and you find who the reformers are within that and you work with them. Is this really what we want our media to be doing on our behalf? We're paying the license fee for this organization. <laughs> well, <okay. laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> um, and I just want to add one point here. Um, sorry, I have to go to my phone because somebody gave me the photograph a bit late. Um, two days ago was the anniversary of the Hula massacre in Syria. Um, and actually, Kavork al Masian has also just sent me some information on this to help me out. Um, if, if you want to follow an amazing commentator on the Syrian crisis, Kavork al Masian, Syriana analysis, please, please um, subscribe to his YouTube channel and follow him. Um, so in 2012, Marco Di Lauro, um, a photographer who is used by Getty Images, posted this on uh, Facebook. Now, this is the famous picture, I don't know if you remember, of bodies laid out in white body bags and a kid jumping over them. He stated, somebody is using illegally one of my images for anti-Syrian propaganda on the BBC website front page. Today, Sunday, May the 27th, at 7 a.m. London time, the attached image which I took in Al-Musayib in Iraq in March 2003 was front page on the BBC website illustrating the massacre that happened in Hula, the Syrian town. And the caption on the website was stating that the images were showing the bodies of all the people that have been killed in the massacre and that the image was received by the BBC by an unknown activist. Sounds familiar. Somebody is using my images as a propaganda against the Syrian government to prove the massacre. Um, on June the 8th and 14th, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, a leading German daily published two reports based on the statements of anonymous eyewitnesses who claimed that members of the armed opposition had committed the massacre and then blamed it on the Syrian government. According to those reports, 700 members of the Free Syrian Army, those moderate rebels, had come to Hula from various towns to kill families that had converted to the Alawite or Shiite faith and had not joined or had refused to join the rebellion. I think that demonstrates very clearly and it's very apt that it's two days um, from the anniversary of that dreadful massacre. Professor Tim Anderson has gone into that in far more depth. Again, I recommend that you read his book, The Dirty War on Syria, and that will give you a lot more information um, on that massacre. <coughs> this is Jaish al-Islam um, that occupied Douma, where the alleged chemical weapon attack took place, and where I actually visited um, three Jaish al-Islam chemical weapon manufacturing sites. And I was told by a number of civilians from that area and from surrounding areas that the terrorists used chemical weapons against the civilians in order to blame it upon the Syrian government and the Syrian army. I was given that testimony many times, so was Eva Bartlett. Um, from people from a number of different, different districts, different families, not related. Um, and so it must be taken into account.
funded by the British government. Their PR is funded by the British government via an organization called Inkestrat. Um, the, through the Conflict and Stability Fund, the government is spending 2.4 million on private contractors. This is taken from the Guardian article that was um, written by a team led by Ian Cobain. Um, the government is spending 2.4 million on private contractors working from Istanbul to deliver strategic communications and media operations support to the Syrian moderate armed opposition. Jayesh al Islam group was named as, as among those who were receiving that PR um, help. The British government endlessly claims non-lethal aid, that it's providing non-lethal aid to the opposition inside Syria. But the lionization, the glorification of these brutal sectarian forces must be considered lethal for the Syrian people. Very recently, um, Peter Hitchens uh, leaked the story that the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, one of the primary providers of narrative and information to all the governments um, working for regime change in Syria, and pretty much all the media and the UN, the think tanks, etc., um, was funded by the British government, <laughs> almost 200,000 in, 200, in, in 2012. Um, so yet again, we're seeing the British government funding a number of these narrative-producing organizations who are misleading us and misinforming us on the Syrian war. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights the UN actually stopped using them because he was conflating the casualty figures of the armed fighters with civilians. So it became clear um, that the number of civilian deaths was being inflated by the use of the deaths of the armed militants included in those civilian figures. And here we come again. <laughs> the Conflict Stability and Security Fund... Um, here, funding, this is between 1st of April 2017 to March 2020. And at the bottom, you have Mayday Rescue, the Syria Civil Defense, which is an insult to the real Syria Civil Defense, to the White Helmets. The real Syria Civil Defense was established. It's Syrian. It was established in 1953. And it services over 85% of inhabited Syria. The White Helmets are embedded exclusively with the terrorist groups, primarily Nusra Front and Nusra Front affiliates. Now, this is sort of <laughs> quite interesting wording on this. This is from the same document. Um, sorry, where am I? <laughs> um, what is important here? Um, you have the wording here that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have stated that the White Helmets are their most routinely reliable source for reporting. Now, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, I won't spend too much time on them now, but they, they are basically a revolving door um, construct designed to facilitate a number of these military and proxy military interventions in target nations. We've seen them being used in Libya and in Iraq and now overwhelmingly inside Syria. And interesting that they're, they're stating that the White Helmets are their most routinely reliable source, an organization that is embedded with terrorist organizations. But this is particularly interesting um, the White Helmets provide essential corroboration. Corroboration. It's a really odd term. That strikes were not targeting Daesh, but moderate opposition entities. That strikes me <laughs> that the White Helmets are corroborating the UK government party line on Syria. I mean, shouldn't it be the other way around, that evidence on the ground dictates policy rather than policy dictates the evidence from on the ground? Or am I being a little bit naive on that? And equally, that they provided confidence to statements made by the UK and other international leaders made in condemnation of Russian actions. Further corroboration. 
And I'm not going to go too deep into the White Hamlets because I'll be here all night. But basically, this organization has been proven to have participated in a number of terrorist atrocities against Syrian civilians and against prisoners of war. Executions that their founder has excused because apparently these murdered civilians by terrorist groups were tried and sentenced to death in a local Sharia court. Well, that makes it okay then. Again, Christopher Black, international criminal lawyer. The other actions of white helmets, as testified to by Syrian civilians, abuse, torture, kidnapping, murder of captured combatants and non-combatants, are crimes under the ICC statute dealing with war crimes and crimes against humanity, Articles 6 through to 8. Our own statement um, questioned the embedding of journalists with terrorist groups. Um, I've forgotten, I think it was Tim that mentioned Krishnan Gurumurthy um, and Noral Denzinki. Martin Chudov, one of the Guardian's favorites um, for reporting on the Syrian war. I wrote an article a while back, uh, Syria, the Guardian journalist who takes afternoon tea with ISIS and survives. How did Martin Chulov survive mingling with extreme terrorist groups like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda. He entered Syria illegally, so he was dependent upon those groups to get him into the areas that he went to. At the time when other people, other journalists like Stephen Foley, sorry, uh, yes, no, James Foley, <laughs> Stephen Sotloff, that's all, um, were being captured and were being... Um, beheaded. John Cantley was captured at that time and is still apparently a captive of um, ISIS. Somehow Martin Chudov escaped all of these ramifications of being associated with these terrorist groups. But not only that, when I actually went through the time that he spent in East Aleppo and I correlated it with uh, civilian testimony from Western Aleppo of atrocities that were committed by the terrorist groups, I discovered that basically Martin Chulov was often with the terrorist groups when they committed those crimes against the Syrian people and against the Syrian army that were defending the Syrian people. For example, um, the bombing or the, or the underground detonation of the Carlton Hotel, one of the most iconic landmarks. Um, nestling at the, at the sort of um, base of the Aleppo citadel in the old city. Now, you might imagine at this point that Martin Chudov might have expressed some sort of regret that, that one of our most, most iconic structures, historically and culturally for the Syrian people, the fact that it had been destroyed was, a, was hideous. But in fact, he described it thus... The giant plumes of dirt and rubble that ballooned several hundred meters skyward as the hotel crumbled, killing 30 to 50 Syrian troops, has fast become one of the most jaw-dropping images of Syria's civil war. Flush with the success of the bomb, the bomber chose to reveal himself to the Guardian as the leader of Aleppo's tunnelers. Not really very regretful at what was actually done. And here is the Carlton before it was destroyed. And here on the right, I was actually able to speak to a member of the uh, special forces that was defending that area of Aleppo and preventing the terrorist groups from encroaching on the civilian areas in West Aleppo. I have to say I was told that almost all of those soldiers have now been killed. But they didn't die in that explosion. Only around 15 or 16 soldiers were actually injured in that, or killed in that explosion. And they were not in the Carlton. They were in um, a smaller building next door. This is a very recent, um, that Mike pointed out to me, sort of infomercial from the DFID talking about the 2.71 billion that has been spent 
in the region, most of it in Syria, since 2012, from the British people. That's you. Um, no, it's not. It's financing, and that's a proven fact. It's proven in my articles. The money that is coming in from the British government to the organizations, the shadow state institutions that are set up in Syria is being diverted to terrorist leaders and to terrorist groups who are a part of those organizations. The political solution would have been agreed by Syria a very long time ago if our media had not maintained and sustained this illegal military intervention by our government. So it's not from the British people, it's from the British government implicating us in one of the worst crimes of our lifetimes, which is the war in Syria and against its people. So what I would really like to leave you with um, is the fact that, in my view, the media is guilty of gross professional negligence at best. At worst, it has criminally and deliberately employed war propaganda to drive consent for yet another unlawful regime change war in Syria. And after Libya and Iraq, they don't have the excuse of there being no precedent. Nobody denies that there is opposition to the Syrian government. It would be insanity to make such a claim. But the opposition I've spoken to and that Eva Bartlett has spoken to and that many of us have spoken with want peace and stability and security. They want the Syria of before 2011 back again. They don't want an escalation of military conflict that will reduce Syria to a failed state and strip them of their right to determine their own future without foreign meddling. As Kavor Galmassian has said in an interview with Patrick on Sunday Wire, the continuum of media misinformation, misdirection and lying by omission is killing the Syrian people. So I want to leave you with the words of a very dear friend, Abdo Haddad from Malula, one of the most ancient Christian towns in the world and, and in Syria, where they still speak and teach Aramaic, the language of Jesus Christ. Because I think his words sum up what we hear all the time from the Syrian people, and none of us can put it more eloquently than this. Malula is an ancient town in Syria that still speaks Aramaic, the same language spoken by Jesus Christ. We truly believe that the enemies of Syria will no longer exist when we win, and we will win this war. Malula was attacked in 2013 by the Syrian army, like Al-Nusra, like Daesh, like al farouk like all of these denominations that most uh, Europeans and Americans call moderate opposition. When we defended Marula, we didn't defend churches. We defended people. We did defended believers. And we defended our choice for a Syrian secular state. We defended our choice to elect our own president. We defended our choice to live in the Syria we love and we like. Thank you, Abdo. Thank you to you all for being here. And thank you to Syria for showing us what resistance really means. <laughs>